northern kingdom is decimated, then the southern kingdom is decimated. And they are in the sense, they are taken to exile. They are expelled. And uh, so um, you see how the history of Israel mirrors the history of Adam. Um, suggesting, you're talking about the spiritual, uh, the spiritual deaths, that uh, there's something spiritual going on that's, motive, that's the moving these two his these histories. I mean, there's you know, something inside the soul of man is such that he just somehow inclines to disobey God. <coughs> and uh, it's that, it's that uh, root of disobedience that has to be overcome in the interior life of the Christian. If our life is the, if, if this is the template for our life, for our, for our inner life. So now, um, Jesus, let's go down to Jesus. <coughs> um, he's born of Israel, of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> at a time when Israel is under the rule of the Romans. And they're chafing under the, and they've been chafing for centuries by the time Jesus is born. First the, under the, what, the, the, the Greeks and the Seleucids, and now the Romans. They, they've always been subjugated to these, these authoritarian powers. So Israel now is in bondage, just like they were in Egypt. And in this, and in this state of bondage, the Lord Jesus is born of a virgin. Not unlike <coughs> Moses, you know, being born of his mother and being found in the reeds. He's, Jesus is born, so now... He, he grows to manhood, and now like Moses and like Joshua, he's going to lead Israel, he's going to lead his people on this exodus. I call it the inner exodus of the gospel. And as soon as he is baptized and is crowned as the king of Israel, where does he go? <laughs> Into the desert. And where does he go from there? Let's back up. What happens in the desert? Where, where, what happens? He's tempted. That, that's the reason he's led into the desert. He was led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. So he overcomes the devil first in the Jordan. Now he overcomes the devil in the desert. Now what happens? You know, for the next two, three years of Jesus' life, what's yes. going on? He now, has six years. Yes, and you, yes, yes. That that that's very powerful because what's what, what what's happening while he's healing the sick and and teaching the word of life? What's happening? The Pharisees, the scribes, the hypocrites, you know, the, the, the lawyers, they're, they're after him. And uh, his life is not a bed of roses. It's interesting, is it not? I mean, that's an interesting metaphor because in the Christmas hymns, he's, this, he's the rose that Mary gives birth to in the cave. But his life is not a bed of roses. He's the, uh, he's the rose that Isaiah is prophesying will make the desert to blossom like the rose. And yet his own life is not a bed of roses. He's constantly harassed, persecuted. Um, until finally, of course, but, you know, he's crucified. He's taken outside the city and he's crucified on the cross. So you could say that as soon as Jesus is baptized, as soon as he is, he is crowned with the King of Israel, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness and finally into the wilderness of death. <coughs> now, this is the template of the Christian's interior life. What should we expect when you're raised up from the baptism or from the baptism of water? What should we expect? Tribulation. Yeah. Those uh, thorns, those weeds that grew from that now grow from the ground. That's what grows in our soul. And so if we're following Christ, if we're truly followers of Christ, where is he going to lead us? Into the desert. But what's the desert? The desert. Well, it's also where the, the, the fallen spirit is. The fallen spirits are in the desert. Well, yeah, but the so devil's we, in the desert. Yeah, so we're, we're battling against ourselves, but also yeah. the divine. Yeah. yeah, but I think first ourselves. Um, yeah, so, yeah, well, the psalmist, I think, tells us what our soul, what the desert is. He says, My soul, my soul thirsts for thee, as in a dry and, water, and parched land where no water is. So the soul is the desert. So this suggests, this, this, this teaches me, this tells me that, um, that in order for me to be a, a Christian, to be a disciple of Christ, to deny myself means that I have to follow Christ into the desert of my soul. Which means what? Well, Aaron, you're the psychiatrist. You, you 
work with people in the desert of their soul, right? right. And that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. We have to face ourselves, right? We have to face ourselves. But there's something specific that we have to face in ourselves. That's the root of all of these problems. And that's what we found in Adam and Eve. That's what we find in the history of Israel. That's what we find in ourselves. <coughs> St. Maximus the Confessor calls it self-love. Um, St. Ephraim calls it greed. Paul the Apostle calls it covetousness. The Holy Prophets call it idolatry. Or disobedience. It's all at the root of our disobedience. It's, it's denying God in order to affirm ourselves. And um, the command is to deny ourselves in order to affirm God. And you'll have life. But no, we try to save our life by affirming ourselves. We go after the ego. You know, we, we pump up the ego. We promote the ego. Instead of denying the ego, in order to find the heart. So to be a Christian, the imperative, the, 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 to be a Christian means to be, means to be led onto this, what I call the inner exodus of the gospel, which is to be led into the desert of my soul and finally to the death of my ego. And the two will die. So the whole of the Christian life is this effort, this work of faith, the essence of which is denying myself in order to find Christ and in order to be led by Christ through the church. This is why the church is so important. We can't do this on our own. We don't have the strength. We don't have the wherewithal. We don't have the knowledge. Uh, how do you go into your soul? Uh, how do you find your heart? How do you find this inner exodus of the gospel? It's, a, it's not a material thing, it's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual thing. How do we do it? Who's going to teach us? You want, you want some man to teach you? I want God to teach me. So that, and what is the church? She's the body of Christ. What are her movements? What are her liturgical movements, her worship? What are her, her hymns, her doctrines, her prayers? What are they? They're the body of Christ. The church is Christ embodied in the prayers, in the hymns, in the liturgical movements. So it stands to reason that when I participate in the life of the church, when I'm saying her prayers, when I'm participating in her liturgical worship, when I'm doing the fast as she prescribes, I'm doing her ascetic, her ascetic disciplines, it, stands, it, it follows that when I'm doing all of this, I'm putting on Christ. I am putting on Christ. I am nailing myself to his cross so that the power of his cross is becoming active in me. And this is how I will find that way of the inner exodus that leads into the tomb of my heart. And no other way. So I can't do it on my own. I think so many of us do it on our own. <laughs> you know, we try to figure it out ourselves. We read something from the Holy Fathers and they say we should be doing this, we should be doing that. We say, I don't know how to do this, I don't know how to do that, so what should I do? And then we devise a way of doing it. You know, you look at yourselves, you see, don't do, I do, I've done that. Maybe I still do. I was reading something this morning, and it says, even, and it says, when you deny even the good in the evil, so you have to get rid of even yes. the good. They say, you mean your acts of good are need to be known by you and to, you're to push them away. Well, because even the good okay. can, be a, can be rooted in self-love. Can be self-love, self and therefore you would not even know it. Yeah, and that's, I think, one reason the Lord says, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Uh, when you pray, go into your closet so that nobody sees. When you fast, anoint your face with the oil of gladness so that nobody knows you're fasting. Because what's that, what we're trying to do here, we're trying to root out this ego, the self-love of the ego. I mean, that, that, that can be kind of dangerous. I think of something like Jung's Black Sun. The Jung's Black Sun? Yeah. But Tim, so, what did I just say? Well, I mean, I mean, the way that we get there is, is through confession, right? We need, we need the, the therapy of the yes, church. Yeah, the therapy of the church, so, yes. So confession really becomes... Jung was brilliant. The, yeah. Jung was brilliant, but what was his, what was his error? He didn't believe in... He relied on his own understanding. Yeah. And he came up with a beautiful edifice. In many, many, many ways, it's, it rings true. But I mean, it, it's not going to heal. No, but it's, that's why I'm saying is, 
what you're what you're saying is true, but it can be really dangerous if you don't do it the right way. Yes, exactly. If you don't do it the right way, right. and that's the challenge. The ego is so slippery; it slips in there without even us realizing. And uh, and that's what we'll, that's what trips us up all the time. That's what we have to come to confess all the time. And by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I think that we are are, are granted to see, um, you know, how my ego has gotten in the way all this time. I look back and I see how my ego has you know, has, has tripped me up all the time. So I can come to confession. I can get back on and get back on the right path. So we understand that the church herself is is this is the garden. She is the garden of Eden, and uh, the ascetic disciplines of the church, the way of the cross, this is the this is the this is the path through the desert that gets us into the heart of the church. And so we have to follow that path. We have to. The, the Father, what did they say? You have to be mindful. You have to be watchful. Well, what are you being mindful of? What are you being watchful of? You have to be watchful of your own. Your own ego, your own self right you know, slipping in and becoming, you, you become self-righteous without even realizing it. Um, you become, uh, you become conceited without realizing it. I mean, you know, we're a bunch of spiritual narcissists and we don't know it. You know, so, and, and, and so how are you going to break it? That's the thing, how are you going to break it? You know, just do what the church tells you to do. Take up your cross. You know, do the fast. You hear me, Joe, just do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> and just doing it, but coming to confession, doing the fast as the church prescribes, according to your strength and circumstance. Just do it. You know, you don't have to you don't have to read it and figure out what I and come to understand it first. Before you start doing it, you just do it. Say your prayers. Even when you don't feel like it, say your prayers. And when you say your prayers, try to say them in a broken and contrite heart. That's what's satisfying. That's what's pleasing to God. Not just rattling off your prayers and then being done and saying, okay, I'm done. I did it. I can go on for the rest of my day. No, but when you're saying your prayers, you're cultivating this broken and contrite heart, which means that you have to stand in the presence of God, which means that you have to bring your mind. You have to bring your mind to bear. You have to bring your mind back. Okay, you bring your mind back. And you start, you start your prayers again. And then, and then and two sentences later, you realize that your mind has run off again. You gotta bring it back. Two minutes later, it's run off again. Two seconds later, it's run off again. And you don't even know that it's run off again until two minutes later. Then you realize the last few minutes, I've been way over here in my mind, way over there. I've not been here. Okay, now you bring it back. And that's the work. And that's the work of the church's society discipline. It's, it's by this work that we're led into the tomb of our heart. I talk about the tomb of the heart. I talk about it. It's not me. It's the it's, it's St. Macarius. If St. Maximus the Confessor, they speak of the part of the tomb. And you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a provocative, it's really a, a, an attractive metaphor or image. And so, you know, it, it resonates. And you want to go, okay, well, what's the tomb of my heart? I want to know what the tomb of my heart is. I'd like to find a way into the tomb of my heart. Well, what are you going to do about it? So you start fiddling it out. You start devising your own, your own plan. Well, it must mean this, it must mean that. Well, who's, who's, who's doing the thinking there? <laughs> we are. To find the tomb of our heart and to find the way of the, of the soul into the heart, just do what the church tells you to do. And she will show us. She will show us. And, we'll come to, and the Holy Spirit will illumine us if we just do, if we just deny ourselves and practice obedience. That's the root of all things, practicing obedience. And then everything. And then it's, it's that root of obedience, in fact, that I think is at the heart of the mystery of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 